first part of our series is what is Odinism. And here we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of this religious belief system so that people who are new to it or are wanting to understand a little bit more about it will have a basic foundation of what the religion is and what it's about as we continue on through the series. So that people can always reference this video and understand uh, the, the ideas and the values that we have as a faith and you know basically where we're coming from. And the, the first thing we want people to understand is that this is the religion of the ancient Teutons. And this spans regions all over Northern Europe, uh, Bavaria, Germany, Iceland, all of Scandinavia, Saxony, England, um, you know, it, it, even like some tribes spread into Italy and uh, so, you know, into Southern Europe. So these, uh, these regions, these cultures, and the Odinist belief system is basically the culture and ancestry of these regions. It is their heritage. It is the heritage of these peoples and their descendants. And when we're, you know, talking about like England, England was, uh, you know, founded by the Anglo-Saxons and all the people in their colonies, uh, including America and Australia, they all came from these, um, you know, these tribes and these peoples that, you know, developed these cultures and had the views and ideas that were Odinic in nature, that they, these people worshiped the gods and goddesses of, the, of these peoples. And, you know, uh, what people have to understand is that the word Odinism and Asatru and all that stuff, these are uh, modern terms. These are modern words that are reflecting of, you know, new ideas and new values that we are presenting because we have to. Because Christianity, you know, took this from us. This legacy was taken from us a long time ago uh, by the Christians. And we're going to talk about that in class, in a uh, video later on. And we're going to discuss the ideas and the the reasons why this happened and why, you know, basically our heritage was stolen from us, why it was taken from us by Charlemagne and the Romans and the, and the, the Catholic Church and, you know, the, the whole idea that this developed from the, um, you know, the, the foundation of Odinist values developed uh, into Western culture and Western civilization that it came about today. But there was that interruption, that interruption that took place with the Christians and it basically, uh, you know, usurped our cultural system, our cultural belief foundation. Okay, so, but in understanding that, in understanding what Odinism is, and understanding that this is the native European religion, we have to understand that it is also the same as the other native faiths in the world, like Shinto of the Japanese, and Yoruba of the Africans, and Hinduism in India, the Mayan religions in, in Central America, uh, the Native American religions. These are ethnic religions. They are cultural. They are ethnic. They are represent the values of the peoples of these lands. They're connected to the land. The stories connect to the land. The gods connect to the land. These are people who have a, a representation from their heritage, from their ancestry, and from the nations that they developed from. Now, the, uh, we have to realize when we're looking at this that cultural and ethnic religion is something that is about self-appreciation. It's about self-worth. It's about family values. It's about connecting to other people. It's about recognizing a value within yourself and not feeling, you know, guilt for who you are, where you came from, having all of that, you know, political correctness or, or uh, monotheist guilt put into your mind that you are somehow a bad person for who you are, or how you were born, or or what you came from, or, or anything like that, you know. So, what we're trying to show people is that, you know, this is, this Odinism is about identity, it's about family, it's about, you know, uh, cultural values, and it's about a lot of the things that some people get to take for granted, and other people aren't even allowed to celebrate at all because of their, they, they feel so guilty for it. They feel that they have to be politically correct. They feel like they have to have some sort of, you know, uh, everything must be for everyone and we can't have anything for ourselves. Whereas other people in other nations, that th this is just how things are. And so there is that appreciation for culture, that is appreciation for ethnicity. And, you know, there are over three million ethnic religionists in the world today. And they're spread all over the planet. And these, you know, these, this is a very large community of different, you know, heathen and uh, ethnic and cultural religions that exist throughout the world. And, you know, it's a very large community. It's a very large group of people. Now, Odinism is a segment of that. It's a, it's a, it's a part.
part of that, but the global ethnic religionist community is, is massive. And, you know, in the same way, looking at that, we also have to consider that even the monotheist religions have uh, cultural aspects to them. Everybody can see that Islam is an Arabic religion. Um, Judaism is obviously a Jewish religion. Uh, Christianity is both Jewish and Greek. It has cultural elements and aspects to it that the reason being is because these developed you know, from pagan and uh, tribal concepts and ideas and that were taken over. They're basically adapted and changed into monotheistic values. And so in understanding that, and understanding that the values that develop culture, that these come from these ancient heathen religions, that they, these formed culture, that when we see that, we can look at how Western civilization developed. That Western civilization actually is built upon the core values of Odinism. That Odinism is Western civilization because at one time, Odinism was the West. It was the religious and cultural foundation of all of Western civilization. And the you know when the Romans and the Greeks spread about and they you know their influence came into it, but we're talking about Northern Europe. We're talking about the um, the ideas and a lot of traditions that we have today that we a lot of people don't know the origins of. Once you investigate them, you see that these are Odinic, like the days of the week. You have you know the seven days of the week are um, six of them are named after Odinic gods. One of them is named after Roman god. You have Sunday, which is named after Sun or Soul. You have Mani's Day or Monday, Moon Day. Um, that's you know Monday. And then you have Tuesday is Tears Day. Tears are God of War. Uh, Wednesday is Woden's Day or Odin's Day. Thursday is Thor's Day. Friday is Frigga's Day or Frey's Day or Freya's Day. And then Saturday is named after the Roman god Saturn. Now these these traditions that developed and became the days of the week are something that you know we look at every day. We see that every day. Some cult some countries did not uh, adapt that. They they actually rejected it because they were so Christianized. They actually kept a, a Latin naming of the weeks of the days of the week. And but we kept it. You know n most Northern European countries did. Most uh, America did. Uh, Australia. A lot of countries kept the naming of the days of the week uh, the way that they are. Um, we have the same thing with a lot of words, uh, a lot of biblical words. Uh, heaven and hell and God, these are all German words. These are words that come from our religion. The gods are gods. There is no God uh, of the Jewish Bible or any of those uh, you know, Semitic religions because their word was not God. Their word was El, and it had a whole different connotation. It had a whole different meaning to it. Whereas for us, God or a God was always a deity amongst the pantheon. And heaven was, you know, the, basically the realm of the divine, the outside, the, the you know, the, the above humanity realm. And then you had hell was actually a good place. Um, hell was, uh, you know, broken up into two realms. It's Hellheim and Niflheim, or Niflhel. And you had, um, it's the same thing with, with Hades in Greece. You know, when, when the Bible was translated from Hebrew into Greek, they wanted to find a way to define the Jewish Sheol or Gehenna, and so what they did was they tr they looked for the Greek word that was the closest equivalent, and they picked Hades. Now Hades is the god of the underworld to the Greeks, and he basically runs Tartarus, which is the realm of the damned, and then the Elysian Fields. Now these are all in Hades, so there's a good place and a bad place right in the realm of Hades. Well, the same thing happened when Christianity started to push its way into uh, into Germany and into Northern Europe. Uh, Old Phyllis translated the Bible and he actually took the same concept and took the word hell and converted it into you know the Christian concept that was is basically a translation of Hades because you had the goddess hell who is benevolent she's a good goddess she's not uh, Loki's daughter the demoness of disease and all that that's her name is actually Lakin and in Hell, who is also Ur, the goddess of fate, she runs Helheim, which is the, like the Elysian Fields, it's the realm of the blessed dead, and then she also is queen over Niflhel, you know, and Loki's daughter is actually her slave. So when we see these concepts and, we, and, and how they've been twisted and how they've been turned, and we see like the holidays like Yule and Easter, those are Odinic holidays. Easter is the goddess of the dawn. 
Uh, she's an Anglo-Saxon goddess of the dawn, and Yule is like their celebration of the return of light. Uh, these became Christmas and the celebration of Christ's rebirth, and you know they were they were twisted to meet the ends of the church to make the church be bolstered and more powerful and more influential over the people. Now, in the same sense, we have the uh, concepts of freedom and law and government that developed and are recognized by some of the founders, uh, some of the uh, early English lawmakers and, and, and the, like Thomas Jefferson in America, he um, you know, understood that these foundations of democracy and republic ideas were from the ancient Teutons, that they were influenced by the Romans, but the direct descent is straight from Germania. And there was a, a French philosopher named Montesquieu who recognized that. He was the one who came up with the concept of the three branches of government, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. And he basically showed how uh, English law was uh, dis descended from old Germanic republics, you know, republican law, tribal law, and which would, became the Anglo-Saxon law, the Anglo-Saxon law became the English law, and the English law became, you know, the United States Constitution, well, the, in, a, in a roundabout way. So, we're looking at the concepts of development of culture and how these religions influence this. Now, we have to understand that when we're talking about the uh, influence of a culture, we're also talking about an influence of ourselves as individuals, as families, as people who connect to the community around them. And our ancestors were very big on genealogy. And so it's like the, the grander faith represented the macrocosm, the nation, the nation, the tribe. But then you had the genealogy, the ancestor, the ancestor worship that was for the family, it was for the microcosm, the smaller groups. And so you have, you have to understand that for every person in a family, you have two parents. So every person who has two parents then has four grandparents, and then eight great-grandparents, and then so on and so forth. It goes back after 20 generations, you're looking at over a million ancestors that you have. Well, we understand that there wasn't that many people back in that time. So there was, there's no way that you had that many ancestors across the earth. And so when you're looking at the, the notion of this, the concept of this, then you have to realize that what you are descended to is people over and over and over again. You have the same ancestor related to and you know, many times over. And so when we're looking at this, the, the genealogies of the ancient kings of Wessex or the, you know, the, the, the study of genealogy in Iceland, which is the, the, the most concise in the entire world, and we understand that our ancestors made this a part of their faith, that this was the main reason why it was so difficult for Northern Europe to be converted. For it took them you know, 700 years to convert all of Northern Europe. And the reason why is because the ancient kings and queens were very meticulous about studying their ancestry. And part of their ancestral line was tracing it straight to the gods. The, the genealogies go all the way straight to Odin. And so when the Christians were coming in and telling them, well, you have to stop worshiping these gods and start worshiping this god, and they're like, well, we don't know who that is. And this, these gods are part of our family. These trace into our genealogy. And that was the major conflict. That was the major issue. So when we see this, this understanding of you know, how we connect to the ancestors and how we connect to the gods, it's, it's microcosm, macrocosm. It's the gods are for you know, a connection to all of us and the ancestors are connections to different individual families. Now, this is how you had the naming of clans. And the naming of clans is something, if, you, if you, anybody who studies Scottish history knows that that's a, a, a very big deal in, in Scotland and in, in some of Ireland and a lot of areas. The study of clans and heraldry is a very big deal. And the, uh, to our ancestors, it was the same thing. You had the clans would basically take an ancestor that they were honoring and they would, they would create a suffix or a prefix to it. Like in Scotland, it's Mac or MC, MAC, like the McLeod clan or the McCullen clan and different clans like that. And, and well, in Northern Europe, you'd have the, uh, you know, the Ealing clan, the, the Burling clan, the Bolson clan. It was always UNG or ING was the end of the clan name. And so what this did was this basically represented in both Scotland and in, in Scandinavia is that this is the clan 
honoring this ancestor, that we are all linked to this ancestor. And so that was why this was so very important and so sacred to them. Now, when we realize this, when we're looking at all of these different facets of Odinism and how there's this cultural facets and these ideas of uh, ethnicity behind it, we have to realize that yeah, obviously a lot of people aren't going are, are to enjoy this, they're not going to like it, they're going to see that this is not for the politically correct because it is an exclusive faith. It is a faith that is exclusive to people of northern European descent. And a lot of people don't like that. But what we're trying to show is that it is inclusive to all heathens in the heathen community because we are all a member of this religious idea, this basic religious idea that we are heathens. And all of the different heathen religions uh, that I mentioned before, like Shinto and Yoruba and the Mayans and the Native Americans, we are all connected to one another in a global community of heathen faith. But we are also exclusive because Odinism is, is just for us. It is our religion. It's from our ancestries and, and, and our people are connected to this religion. And you know, if you, if you try to sign up for the Church of Native America, you have to actually show people that you have so much blood from Native American culture, from you know, the Native American ancestry. It's just commonplace and it's accepted and, and, and no one looks down on it. And so what we're trying to show is that this is the same thing, this is the same concept. Um, what we see, what we actually look at is when you have the notion of one deity and only one deity, and that deity has to have a, a race of people that is, that is you know, only looked after by him and everyone else is not, then that in itself becomes racist because you have, uh, in its nature, monotheism is antagonistic because of the idea of one. When you have many gods and many goddesses, then everybody can be accepted because I can fully ex accept and believe in the validity of deities of any people that they exist for that people. And so there is no like, shutting down of walls, there is no attacking people, there is no reason for me to have, as a, as a heathen, for me to have any animosity towards anyone of any faith at all. Because I accept the validity of any, of any of these ideas. And so as we move on, as we continue on through the, through the course and through these videos, you'll you know, we're, we're hoping that we'll give people a bit much better understanding of this religion and how it works and how it develops. Thank you.